We have talked about in-flight fires before on the channel. An in-flight fire can be an extremely horrifying scenario for anyone who boards an aircraft, whether they are a passenger or a pilot. Perhaps one of the most shocking cases of a deadly in-flight fire occurred on July 11, 1991. A chartered flight operating for Nigeria Airways caught fire at the takeoff from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. The pilots of the Douglas DC-8 struggled in an attempt to make it back to the airport. What caused this fire, and why couldn't the pilots properly control their plane? Though the accident of Nigeria Airways Flight 2120 occurred with an African carrier in the Middle East, to gain more context surrounding the airline, we must look towards Canada, more specifically at the airline Nation Air. Nation Air was a Canadian charter airline based out of Montreal. As part of their services, they operated routes for other air carriers on a charter basis. These charter contracts were sometimes with international airlines, which led Nation Air to operating a Douglas DC-8 for Nigeria Airways during the Hajj season. The Canadian airline had developed a negative reputation over its years of operation, stemming from mechanical problems and poor on-time performance. For the Hajj flights with Nigeria Airways, Nation Air stationed their own crew members and mechanics. Flight 2120 was a return flight back to Nigeria heading to Sokoto. At this time of the year during the Hajj, Jeddah Airport becomes one of the busiest in the world. Every year, pilgrims in their millions make their way to Mecca, the holiest site in all of Islam. A special Hajj terminal was constructed at the airport to accommodate the high influx of traffic during this time. For many passengers on board Flight 2120, this was the ending of a once-in-a-lifetime trip. The flight was organized by an organization called Hull Trade in Nigeria, headed by the Sultan of Sokoto, to allow local Nigerian pilgrims to make this holy duty of partaking in the Hajj. Piloting this Canadian-registered DC-8 was a crew of three. 47-year-old William Allen had extensive flight experience as a pilot in the Canadian Air Force, logging a total of 10,700 flight hours. 36-year-old First Officer Kent Davidge was sitting in the right-hand seat. With 8,000 flight hours, he was the one who was supposed to be handling the aircraft on this flight. 46-year-old Victor Fur was the third member of the flight crew as the flight engineer. He, along with the two other flight crew members, had a collective flight time of just 2,500 hours on the DC-8. Also on board was a Nation Air mechanic, Jean-Paul Felipe, and a project manager, Aldo Tetamanti. Prior to departure of Flight 2120, the mechanic had took measurements of tire pressure on the main undercarriage landing gear. Tires number 2 and 4 were measured to be below the minimum requirement. The tires were filled with nitrogen gas. The mechanic, in an attempt to source this gas, found that none was available at Jeddah Airport that morning. A few days prior to the accident, the aircraft's tires were supposed to be replaced. However, after some communication from Nation Air Management, at a risk of losing charter flight contracts, it was decided to skip the replacing of the tires, which led to the exchange in Jeddah. A document found at the crash site revealed that tire pressure values had been altered to make it seem like the tire pressure was within normal limits. What followed was a breakdown between corporate management at the airline and the standards set out to keep passengers and crew safe. Management at Nation Air were unwilling to accept any delay to the flight, demanding that the plane departed on time, as mechanic Jean-Paul Felipe only decided to try and fill the underinflated tires just 20 minutes before departure. Despite the mechanic knowing the condition of the landing gear tires, Flight 2120 left the gate at Jeddah with two tires underinflated in order to meet the schedule. The project manager released the plane to fly by having the flight engineer sign the appropriate paperwork. The flight engineer did not have any involvement with the servicing of this aircraft. There was also no communication from either the mechanic Jean-Paul Felipe or project manager Aldo Tetamanti to the pilots on the condition of the plane's landing gear. The Saudi investigation ruled that the aircraft in this condition was unairworthy. There was also no evidence to suggest that the flight crew were notified of this. On board Flight 2120 were 247 passengers and 14 crew members. It was typical Saudi summer weather that day with blisteringly hot temperatures and clear skies. 
temperatures often exceed 40 degrees Celsius. It has even been known that temperatures can even soar to above 50 degrees in the summer months. Despite being just after 8 in the morning, temperatures had already exceeded 30 degrees. It is believed that the soaring outside temperature contributed to the accident. The landing gear tires need to be pressured in order to support the weight of the plane evenly. The underinflated tires in the Saudi summer heat made them prone to bending and becoming more flexible. This was not helped by the fact that Jeddah Airport is of an extremely large size even in 1991. Flight 2120 needed a taxi a long distance to make it to their departing runway. The time was just before 8.30am when flight 2120 was preparing for departure on runway 34 left. As normal, the aircraft began its takeoff roll. As the plane began accelerating, the first of two tyres failed on the undercarriage landing gear, followed by the second. This failure of the tyres was heard by the pilots on the flight deck. They chose not to abort the takeoff. The cockpit instruments appeared to show nothing out of the ordinary. Meanwhile, outside of the aircraft, an immense amount of heat was now being generated from friction with the runway. According to the accident report, this ignited the remaining remnants of rubber and a fire had now been started and was self-sustaining. As the pilots continued with their takeoff, the DC-8 left the ground at Jeddah at 8.29 am. Just seconds later, the pilots routinely retracted the landing gear. By this time, the left side undercarriage was in flames. The pilots took a fire into the sky with them and the burning landing gear was pulled into the plane's wheel well compartment. The fire now inside the plane was allowed to continue to burn as at the time there was no requirements for aircraft wheel compartments to contain any smoke or fire detection equipment. Therefore the flight crew had no idea that they had just taken a fire into the air with them. The wheel compartments on the DC-8 also housed electrical wiring and hydraulic systems of which the fire was beginning to burn through. For the first few moments of the flight all seemed normal until certain systems began displaying abnormalities. According to their instruments, the plane did not appear to be pressurizing. There were also warnings that seemed nonsensical to the pilots. The speed brake warning light had been activated, which would normally tell the pilots that the speed brakes located on the wings had been deployed. The flight crew suspend their climb and level off at 2,000 feet. There was also some confusion on the air traffic controller's end. Another aircraft, a Saudi Airlines plane, had also reported a pressurization problem in an extremely unlikely coincidence. The controller mistook Flight 2120 for the Saudi flight. Despite this confusion, investigators would later determine that this did not impede Flight 2120's progress in attempting to return to the airport. Investigators would later accuse both the Saudi and Nation Air pilots for not using their call signs appropriately to identify their planes in radio communication. The plane was to be flown away from the airport in a left turn. The plane would then line up for a landing on runway 34 left, the same runway they took off from. In order to do so, they need to fly over the city of Jeddah itself. The pilots were not aware of the fire as of yet, and so believed their problem was much less serious to the actual situation, and so did not make an urgent request to land immediately. This led the pilots to make a left-hand approach pattern to line up with a runway from the south. Over the next several minutes, the fire on board quickly started to burn its way through the critical hydraulic systems, which allowed the pilots to control the plane's control surfaces from the cockpit. In the wheel compartment, there were nearby aileron pulleys made of a magnesium alloy, which was soon affected by the fire. The accident report says that, if ignited, would have significantly increased the temperature of the fire and increased the potential for involvement of the fuel stored in the center wing tank. It was not until a flight attendant had entered the cockpit with news of smoke and fire in the cabin that the pilots knew that there was a fire. The fire had now burned its way through the cabin flooring. The first officer's flight controls had gone dead, having lost controls on his side. This forced Captain Allen to take over. In this transfer of flight controls, the cockpit voice recorder ceased functioning. The plane, however, was still flying and communicating with ATC. The controller was now able to distinguish between the two problem planes as Flight 2120 now requested a full emergency landing at Jeddah. Among these communications with ATC was the details regarding a fire and lack of flight controls. It is unknown on what series of events transpired in the cabin. According to some investigators, it is believed that panicked passengers would have scrambled towards the front of the plane. 
Some may even have attempted to open the doors. A side note, opening an aircraft door in this scenario has supposedly been performed before on a passenger plane. At a low enough altitude and at a low enough speed, the doors can be opened in flight. The prime case of this being South African Airways Flight 295, an event which occurred just over three years prior to the Nation Air incident. In the South African Airways case, it was deemed necessary for the crew to perform an action of opening a passenger door to clear the noxious smoke which had filled the cabin from an in-flight fire of unknown origin. This incident will receive its own video soon. As for Flight 2120, the onboard fire had weakened the structural integrity of the DC-8. Parts of the plane began breaking away, leaving holes in the aircraft's skin. Shockingly, bodies from the plane were found as far away as 11 miles from the airport, over the city of Jeddah itself, suggesting that passengers were falling from the burning plane as it began to break apart. Flight 2120 had managed to line up in the general direction of the airport from the south, with only a few miles to the runaway. It is unknown on whether the pilots could actually land their plane safely, as all control was practically lost from the plane in its final moments. There are two versions of events with regards to the action of lowering the aircraft's landing gear. One suggests that the landing gear was lowered in the plane's final seconds. In this moment, the DC-8 broke apart with the majority of the plane nosediving into the Saudi desert, just a few kilometers from Jeddah airport. The other, as suggested in the accident report, mentions that evidence in the form of an eyewitness in another aircraft, and from the fact that bodies had fallen from the plane, the landing gear was lowered some 11 miles from the airport. Regardless, the plane in its final seconds lost control, crashing into the sand in a nose-down position. 261 people, everyone on board Nigeria Airways Flight 2120, were killed in the crash. After the accident, Nation Air had speculated that the plane may have run over a foreign object on the runway, which contributed to the tyres in question bursting. A scenario eerily close to this occurred nine years later in 2000. An Air France Concorde Flight 4590 crashed at Paris due to the plane running over a foreign object leading to a ruptured fuel tank. To say the occupants' final moments on the Nation Air plane were horrifying would be an understatement. Injuries sustained by not only the crash but in-flight fire included facial disfiguration, many passengers' bodies were missing limbs, some had their bodies torn to pieces and reddened from burns. One source indicating how the skin of some passengers became fused with the metal framing of the passenger seating. The crash of Flight 2120 directly contributed to the demise of Nation Air as an airline. The poor public image led to them ceasing operations in 1993. Multiple safety recommendations were made following the release of the accident report. All aircraft must now be equipped with fire detection in the landing gear compartments. Flight crews now receive training on tyre performance and vulnerability. The Douglas DC-8 has now long since been retired from passenger service. Flight 2120 not only became the deadliest accident to involve a Canadian airline, but also the deadliest accident to occur with a DC-8. Hello everyone, this is the end of the video. If you found it interesting, as always, be sure to subscribe as there is a new video every Saturday. Just a quick thing to mention, in this video I briefly mentioned the Air France Concorde incident. I actually have made a video on the subject which is an exclusive video for my patrons on Patreon. If you would like to consider joining, the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. Joining from £3 per month will get you early access to all new videos and any exclusive content that arises. You also have the opportunity of having your name read out from pledges starting at £5 per month. And with that, I can segue into thanking my patrons for their amazing support. A thank you to my £5 tier patrons, Avery Teoda, Erin Wilson, Hector Palmatellas, Ken Zachman, Kevin Connors, Christy, Leon San Jennings, Marie Ennis, MG, Pacman 7, Panic Chicken, Rebecca Rivers, Surya Melody, Sleepy, So FP, and Su So Su Shoes. An incredible thank you to my £10 tier patrons. I may be adding a new perk to the £10 tier soon, and hopefully more info will drop on the Patreon in due time. Thank you to Ada Montgomery, Alex, Anne Sid, Daniel Hendricks, Derek Bean, Karma, Mike Milton, Side Effect, Roger Mayer, 
and where are my Cheetos. Thank you all so much. And that is it from me this week. Have a good weekend, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.